Good morning, everybody. Tommy here with CRISPR Talk. Good to see you again. Um, here to remind you that I'm not a financial advisor, and anything I say or show you is definitely not a recommendation to buy or sell any security. Um, please do your own research. I just give my own opinion, and of course, as you all know about opinions, they can be wrong. Um, so I was speaking to somebody yesterday about cell therapy, um, and this person um, said, yeah, he liked uh, fate therapeutics as well. And some of you all have asked about fate ther th therapeutics. Um, I, um, um, uh, I've read about it. I I'm not all that learned in it, although the past 24 hours I've been doing a lot of reading about it. I'm very impressed with them. So today I thought I would show you uh, I, I thought I'd give you all a introduction into fate therapeutics because there is just too much to put in one video. So I think, you know, we could probably actually make this, this a series of videos on all the things that they're doing. But today I thought it would be a good idea to give you a basic overview of fate therapeutics and exactly what they do and where their technology is derived from. So in order to do that, let me show you something I used to show my students uh, four or five, six years ago. I created this lecture about called time travel. Is time travel possible? And if any of you out there are teachers, if you ever start with a slide like this, talk about time travel or something bizarre like that, students are immediately, their attention is immediately drawn to what you're going to talk about. So that was my little trick here. So is time travel possible? Well, let's find out. I'm going to give you all a uh, abbreviated version of this lecture, then we'll get into fate therapeutics. Is time travel possible? Well, those of you all who ever took a biology class, I'm sure you've seen a picture similar to this, right? It is a uh, classic textbook of a cell, and it shows all the different components of a cell, and the nucleus, endoplasmic reticulum, smooth and rough, the cytoskeleton centrioles, plasma membrane, all that stuff. Right, But it doesn't really tell you anything about the cell, what it does, its function, nothing like that. It's just a, you know, a checklist of things that some cells, that most cells have. This is really important. Since early biological studies, the central idea has been that cells are what's called terminally differentiated. That is, when I was in college, you know, back in the late 80s, I started college as an older student, back in the late 80s, you know, that was really ingrained in our brains. It's, you know, the terminal differentiation of a cell. You know, you go from point A to point B. Once you're at point B, you ain't going back to point A. That's the idea. So the idea is that the cells are what they are and will never be anything else, which is kind of depressing when you think about it, you know. <laughs> um, this is a uh, loop video of some beating cardiomyocytes in vitro. Uh, I've always liked looking at it, looking at these cells contracting, beating these heart cells. I think it's really neat. They will always be heart cells, right? According to the idea, these will always be, all, always be heart cells. You can't take these heart cells and turn them into, you know, I don't know, a kidney cell or something, you know? Um, this is a picture I took when I was at UAB. Um, these are what's called lung fibroblast cells. Fibroblasts are very common cells, lung fibroblast cells, from a uh, patient that had idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. It's a fatal lung disease. Um, idiopathic because we don't know what causes it, which is what, that's what we were working on in the lab. And I took this picture um, about a transcription factor called NRF2. Um, no, none of all this is, is important, this NRF2, this, this IPS stuff. My only point is that look at these cells, look at these cells and look at this, trans, at this transcription factor responding to the stimulus. Stimulus here is called CDDO. Without it, you can see NRF2 is not in the nucleus. With it, you can see NRF2 is in the nucleus of all these cells. It's a translocation of a transcription factor into the nucleus of a cell upon stimulation with this molecule called CDDO, which is called a triterpenoid, but that's not important. My point is that these lung fibroblasts will always behave like this. They are lung fibroblasts. You know, 
they, they won't become heart cells. This is another picture I took from a, from a normal lung. This is immunohistochemistry against a, a protein called smooth, mu smooth muscle actin. And you'll find that in blood vessels. Of course, this is what lines your blood vessels. So this is the blood vessel within your lung. This is the blood vessel within your lung. You know, there'll always be lung cells. These are mouse uh, cortical neurons. These are brain cells from a mouse. My wife took this picture. She does a lot of work with mice, still does. She just drove to work two hours ago. I'm sure she's going to be killing some mice pretty soon. <laughs> um, funny stuff. They will always be cortical neurons. Islets of Langerhans, you know, the beta cells and all those cells of the pancreas. We have talked about those with respect to CRISPR and Viacite. You know, they will always be islet cells. Here's another brain cell called an astrocyte. They look like little stars. That's why they're called astrocytes. They'll always be that. Well, perhaps the greatest discovery in medicine occurred in 2006 using mice cells and in human cells in 2007. I say here the greatest discovery in medicine. This is, of course, um, I made this lecture before CRISPR. I think both of them are equal, the greatest discovery in medicine. And now, um, in 2006 and 2007, using my uh, human cells, this is the guy, Dr. Yamanaka, who made the discovery. Um, before I tell you what he did, I need to let you all know about a very basic thing about animal development. Um, remember that guy named Doug Melton that we mentioned about semitherapeutics and vertex? He was into all this stuff. If you ever look at animal development and germ layers, I'm sure you're going to find his name pop up. But early on in animal development, you will have three different tissues. The ectoderm, uh, which is on the outside, the mesoderm, which is in the middle, and the endoderm, which is on the inside. Right? Embryonic tissues have these three different germ layers. So know those terms, ecto, meso, and endo. And, and these three different germ layers give rise to all the tissues of the body. So what Dr. Yamanaka did is he said he took some adult cells, some fibroblast cells, and these are just cells, you know, hanging out in the extracellular matrix, just fibroblast cells. You can get them easily. It's no big deal. Um, and what he did is he played around with them for a little bit, and he gave them, he, he, uh, gave them four different genes. He did what's called IPS, inducible pluripotent cells. He gave them four different genes. These genes are called CMYK, Kruppel-like factor 4, KLF4, SOX2, and OCT34. Um, remember these two names, SOX2 and OCT34. He gave them, he gave these fibroblasts, these four different genes. Does that, right, goes home, next day goes in the lab, all, all of a sudden the cells look different, right? He says to himself, oh my God, these look like stem cells. You know, did we turn these fibroblasts into stem cells? So they eventually made what's called the teratoma. You know, what was eventually made was a, what's called the teratoma in mice, where they take these iPS cells, inducible pluripotent stem cells, what they thought was that, inject them into the mice, and of course it grows into a tumor, and they take the tumor and they dissect it, and guess what they found? Ectoderm, mesoderm, endoderm. Do you guys get that? That means that the, uh, that the iPS cells that they formed from these, just these four different genes being cranked up, just those four, was capable of turning a fibroblast back in time, time travel, to a stem cell. That's incredible, right? And that stem cell was capable of developing all the tissues of the body. That is what's called an inducible pluripotent stem cell. And that is what fate therapeutics is all about. That is the essence of fate therapeutics. One cell, many fates. Um, let's get into fate. Ticker symbol, F-A-T-E. They have about 930 million cash. That's an updated number. They just completed an offering. Um, of over 5 million shares, I, I think it was. Their shares outstanding is 92.3 million, but I think it's, I think you have to add in the extra 5 million for the offering. So I think they have about 97 or 98 million shares out, out, outstanding. 
I think someone can verify that for me. Um, they have nine cleared INVs. That's right. You, you, you see that number correctly, nine. Um, they have many products in development and testing. These guys are what's called rocking and rolling. These guys are really nailing it. So here's what they want to do. They want to take human-induced pluripotent stem cells. I'll get to how they make them in a second. They do it a little bit different from what Dr. Yamanaka did. But by the way, Dr. Yamanaka received the Nobel Prize for his work. And in fact, his work was so monumental, they like gave him the Nobel Prize immediately. Kind of like the, um, you know, the ladies with the uh, CRISPR. It, it's, just, it's just so groundbreaking. You have to rewrite a biology textbook because of this work. Um, what does Kathy Wood like to invest in? Innovation, right? Things that change things. This is one of those companies. Um, they take their uh, induced pluripotent cells, engineer them, and then they can uh, engineer pluripotent cell line. Just have a whole, a whole bunch of them. And from these, they can make induced T cells. I think that's what this I stands for. It's from the inducible pluripotent stem cells. They can make T cells. They can make natural killer cells, which is what we'll get to today briefly. CD34 positive cells. You may remember CD34 is the marker for hematopoietic stem cells. These are the cells that CRISPR Therapeutics and other companies working on sickle cell purify before they CRISPR edit them. And they can make other cells and they can address just lots of different therapies. This is a, a picture taken from their corporate presentation. Their single inducible pluripotent stem cell clone. So it's a clone. So they're all the same. They can make millions of these cells and they're all the same. Right. And here's um, it's they call it a renewable source for making cell products. Right. Potential to differentiate into 200 plus cell types. Right. Remember the picture of the beating cardiomyocytes I showed you? They can probably make that, you know, the beta cells for the um, islets of Langerhans. They can make that, I bet. All kinds of other cell lines, master cell lines and banks. It's uniform in composition, so you don't get a lot of variation or any variation, probably. Um, it's been extensively characterized, so on and so forth. I love this picture. It shows everything. Let's go into very briefly the difference between innate and adaptive immunity. I do not have a lot of experience in immunology. I'm more of a, you know, protein, you know, a DNA, RNA, protein kind of a guy lab rat kind of a guy, but basically, you know, you have the innate immunity and you have the adaptive immunity, right? What we're going to talk about here today briefly are these natural killer cells. And you may ask yourself, are these the same natural killer cells that we've been discussing with respect to Precision Bio and their stealth product and CRISPR therapeutics and the B2M are the natural killer cells killing it? Yes, these are the same cells, all right? So that's another, you know, my, my brain's kind of going 500 miles an hour now, but that's another reason why I wanted to talk about fate today, because what they're doing is related to what we've talked about in previous videos, all right? So um, it's just kind of interesting how, the, how these videos are evolving and they're all um, touching each other, so to speak, with respect to what they're working on. Um, innate immunity. So they don't have to have a previous exposure to it. You know, like, why do you have to go and get the COVID vaccine? Well, you have to expose your, you know, your adaptive immunity system to the COVID protein so they can adapt to it. So they can adapt to it. So next time they see COVID virus in your body, they can kill it. Innate immunity doesn't need that. And it's not just natural killer cells too. It's macrophages and other uh, cells that, that are involved in the innate, innate immunity. And here's some basic differences, right? Innate immunity is something already present in the body. Ad adaptive immunity is created in response to an exposure. That's what I was saying about the COVID vaccine. Um, the response of innate is very fast. The adaptive immunity response can be slow. You guys can pause the video and look at all these differences between the two types. 
So here's, here's what fate wants to do. They want to make off-the-shelf, inducible, pluripotent stem cells derive natural killer cell cancer immunotherapy. They want to make a whole franchise about that, right? So they want to make natural killer cells. And how these natural killer cells work is they have these lytic granules inside them. Little granules that contain powerful enzymes that can be injected into the cells, into the cancer cell or foreign cell, and, and uh, kill it from within. All right? So natural killer cell mediated lysis, the granules get injected, right? The cells start to die. All sorts of things like chemokines, whatever, get released. This then activates T cells, right? So natural killer cell trafficking, natural killer cell mediated lysis of these tumor cells. Um, uh, all these chemokines and stuff get released. T cells say, hey, man, something's going on over here. Something's going on over here. So the T cells come on over, check things out and say, oh, we got to start killing this stuff. So then the T cells start to infiltrate into the tumor, into the tissues, and then the T cells start to get activated and start killing. So it's a one-two punch, basically, if you, if you want to think of it that way. Starting off with the natural killer cells killing stuff. Uh, Y'all can pause the video. This is from Fate Therapeutics and read this. I don't want to read the whole thing to you. Um, but natural killer cells are the body's first line of defense against disease. Um, Natural killer cells can selectively identify stress ligands, so on and so forth. Um, another thing y'all need to know is something called checkpoint inhibitors. We have mentioned this briefly, especially this particular one, PDL1, right? The program death receptor and the program death receptor ligand. We have mentioned that. So, for example, some tumor cells, tumor cells will actually make uh, the ligand. When the ligand gets recognized by the death receptor by PD-1, well, that's okay. The tumor can escape the killing of the natural killer cells, right? It's a way for them to hide, okay? They're blending into the crowd, so to speak, by making PDL one right? But if a tumor cell is lacking PDL one right, then the natural killer cell can identify it as foreign and then start to kill it, right? That's called checkpoint inhibitors. So if you can inhibit this checkpoint, if you can inhibit this PDL1, then you can get natural, uh, natural killer cell activation. And there's drugs on the market right now that are checkpoint inhibitors, and Fate is using some of them. So let's go back in time. Fate is a very young company. Um, you know, only been around a couple of years. Um, 2018, Faith Therapeutics enters into exclusive license agreement with Gladstone Institutes for CRISPR-based cellular reprogramming. Once again, you know, a lot of this stuff probably couldn't be done without CRISPR. So it, it, CRISPR just came along at a great time. Um... This is a paper, while CRISPR is a powerful tool that can precisely edit the genome, Dr. Ding, the author of this paper, the senior author, repurpose CRISPR, this is very important, repurpose CRISPR to enable target gene activation, allowing regulation of endogenous gene expression. This is a concept that where you take the CRISPR molecule, the Cas molecule, you deactivate it so it doesn't cut any DNA. All right, it's dead. You, you, some people call it dead CRISPR. You deactivate it. It's, it's got a guide RNA. That can take it to the part of the genome. But now, instead of cutting the DNA and editing the DNA, the CRISPR sits there. And it can do whatever you program it to do. If you program it to turn on a gene, it can do that. If you attach a transcriptional repressor to the CRISPR, then it will repress. Um, transcription of, of a gene. Here's the origins of FATE, the FATE inducible pluripotent stem cell. Here is that paper. All right. It was published February 2018, so it's still very new. All right. 
CRISPR-based chromatin remodeling of the endogenous OCT4. Does that sound familiar, Dr. Yamanaka? Remember the four um, uh, transcription factors that he gave those cells? I actually remember two of them, right? OCT4 or SOX2 locus enables reprogramming to pluripotency. You know, this is an amazing title. So how did they exactly do that? I obviously can't go into the whole paper for you, um, but here it is in one figure. They're taking fibroblasts, all right? Like the same fibroblasts I showed you before, they are reprogramming them to induce pluripotent stem cells. They're using something called a deactivated sun tag gene activation system. <laughs> Holy crap, you know, this sounds complicated. Here's what it is in essence. Here would be the endogenous OCT4 gene of the fibroblasts. They're taking the CRISPR, the dead CRISPR, the deactivated CRISPR. The CRISPR can sit on here and then can do, it, can, it has these transcription factors associated with it, and it can acetylate histones. You're saying, well, what's histone acetylation? Well, we haven't gone into this in this channel because it gets into, you know, basic biology stuff, molecular biology stuff. But, you know, your DNA, right, is associated with all these proteins. These proteins are called histones. And in chemistry, if you put a, what's called an acetyl group on these histones, it can actually open up the DNA and allow for easy transcription. That's what's happening here. The sun tag gene activation is taking CRISPR, moving it over to OCT4 or to the endogenous SOX2 gene, and it's turning them on. All right? Wow. So, that's what they do. They do that, then they generate their inducible pluripotent stem cells, they do all sorts of testing on it, and they can expand them. Remember, stem cells do two things, right? They can differentiate into whatever cell that you want them to differentiate into, if you know how to do it. But the, perhaps the most important thing that they do is stem cells regenerate themselves, right? They regenerate themselves so they don't run out. You always have them. Um, uh, one of Fate's products is called FT500, all right? And it's the first ever inducible pluripotent stem cell derived cell therapy in a, uh, that's been approved for clinical use in the United States. It's a non-engineered natural killer cell derived from the inducible pluripotent stem cell. So it's kind of like their base model. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of like the Honda Civic. It's a base model, but it's very good. You know, <laughs> we have a Honda Civic. Um, first news of patient treated was in, in April 2019. Uh, there's it's and and the trial involves three once weekly doses, either by itself in a monotherapy or in combination with one of these three FDA approved checkpoint inhibitors. Remember I showed you about PDL1 and inhibiting that? That's a checkpoint inhibitor, right? Well, they're using their cells by themselves or in combination with one of these three. Let's go to their corporate presentation just for some pictures and stuff, and then we will call it a day. So here's, this is how fast they have grown. July 2018, first IND submission, 87 employees, 78 million in cash. September 2020, they got nine cleared INDs, 250 employees, 930 million in cash. That's a rocket ship taking off. You know, they are killing it. Clearly, this company knows how to get the job done. Clearly. Here's some of their um, comparisons to Cell Therapy 1.0 and there's Cell Therapy 3.0. So this is changing the game in cell therapy. Universal off-the-shelf cell products derived from renewable master cell lines. So the cell source, for example, like all the CAR T's that we've talked about, you know, the autologous ones are from the patient itself, but you also have the allogeneic ones that we've spent a lot of time talking about. Those are from donor cells. Right, you got to keep on getting donor cells. You're getting T cells here. You don't have to do that. You have the renewable master cell line. Do you guys understand that? All you got to do is go to the freezer, grab more of the inducible pluripotent stem cells, 
and make more T cells if you want. Make more natural killer cells. You know, make more CD34 positive cells. Um, uh, the genetic airing, uh, en engineering, random and variable here with um, cell therapy 3.0, uniform and complete. Uh, can have imprecise characterizations, well defined. The product identity of the previous cell therapies are heterogeneous, heterogeneous, heterogeneous. <laughs> We'll get, I'll get my brain to work in a minute. Hold on a second. You got a, he, a heterogeneous population. Here it's a, a homogeneous population. And you guys can read all this. They can do multiple dosing as well. Um, I'm not sure this is right, single dosing. You know, the CAR T's give multiple dosing. Um, but, you know, um, but here you can get multiple dosing as well. Um, here's that picture I showed you before. Um, here's just to show one thing where they can have 100% of the cells. Here's, this is a really cool figure. Remember, this is called flow cytometry. We've, we've done this. We've shown some figures for this before. Well, you can edit it. Here, the correctly edited one is represented in these blue dots, and you can isolate them. And here they show cells that have a CAR and that are lacking TCR, uh, alpha, and beta. 100% of the cells are what they want. All right, here they are making bona fide natural killer cells from a clonal master engineered IPS cell bank. So here's how they make them. Day zero, they take their inducible pluripotent stem cells. All right, here's the markers that they're using for it. They've got nearly 100%. I think we can call it almost 100% here. Uh, day 10, only 10 days later, 10 days, they now have CD34 positive cells right here. 69.9% of them, 70% are CD34 positive. Remember, this is the marker for hematopoietic stem cells. Remember, hematopoietic stem cells are the blood stem cells that give rise to all blood cells of the body, right? Natural killer cells being one of them. Day 44, they now have their natural killer cells, and they're using these two markers, CD45 positive and CD56 positive. Look at the amount. 99.7%. Nearly 100% of these cells are exactly what they want. Greater than a million fold expansion. From 1 million IPS cells, inducible pluripotent stem cells, they can get 10 to the 12th inducible natural killer cells. <sighs> wow. All right. Here's a whole bunch of this products that they're working on. FT500 is what I showed you before. As you can see, they have a whole bunch of other stuff. And this is what I, I'm going to plan my other videos about. My next video may talk about FT516, FT596, so on and so forth. So we'll go into these. What else we got here? They've already got 35 patients dosed with 150 doses of their natural killer cells using FT500, 516, 596, and 538. Safety, demonstrated ability to administer up to six doses safely in an outpatient setting. No CRS, ICANS, graft versus host disease at dose levels less than or equal to 300 million cells per dose. Clear evidence of anti-tumor activity in initial low doses. And they keep on going on. And I don't have time to go into all these right now. But that is fate therapeutics. Um, that's the basics of fate therapeutics. Um, you know, I, I am very impressed with them. And I can see why uh, ARK Invest has bought, you know, an enormous amount of shares of them. I don't know how much they own right now, but, I'm, but I know it's a lot. Um, if, you know, this is a candidate, this is a, this is a company that changes things. If you believe that cell therapy is going to be a part of the future, and I clearly do, uh, as many other people do, then I think fate is definitely worth a look at. It's it's worth investigating to see if it's a good investment for you. Um, that's it.
We'll see you next time. Bye.